So I want to take you to a time. It's Christmas time. How many of you guys like Christmas? Woohoo! Christmas time. So imagine you are planning to give gifts to your family. And you've got one family member in particular you're planning on giving a gift to. And that person is around the age of 16. You take that person and you take them to the car lot and you look at cars. Now, you have the finances to purchase said car. You pick out a car. You, everything, everybody's excited, but you're telling them they can't have it till Christmas time. So you go, you, you pick everything out, you plan everything, and you give them their gift Christmas morning. And they take that box from your hands. It's a little box about like this. And they open that box up. And they open that box up. And they rip the lid off. And it's a video game. And you got them need for speed video game. And the look on their face of pure disappointment. Because they, you took them to the car lot. You showed them the car. You had the finances to purchase the car. But you got them something that was similar. You got them something where they could drive, but in a fictional world. You were excited to give it to them, but it wasn't what they asked for or what you led them to believe they would get. How disappointed would you be if that happened? In our Christian walk, we have times when we get alone with God. And we have moments with God where God really speaks to us and we really feel like, okay, God, this is it. This is the moment when everything changes, when everything, we lay everything down at his feet and we offer ourselves to him. And then we get up and we go on believing that we have answered the call. We have done what God's asked us to do. We've given our lives over to him. And we live this life of obedience and of a sacrifice instead of being broken. We have this moment of sacrifice, but it's truly not brokenness. Today I've come, as, come to bring us back to brokenness. Broken doesn't mean weak or powerless. Broken is not a place of turmoil. Lauren said yesterday, that may be man's definition but God wrote the dictionary, man, or man wrote the dictionary, God didn't. Dictionary.com refers to it as this, reduced to fragments, changing direction abruptly, interrupted, disrupted, or discontented. We as Christians need to start living a life of brokenness, broken by him and not allowing the things of life to break us. Broken is a place. It's a place where we turn our lives totally over to God and we allow him to be the answer instead of our focus shifting a whole other places. He should be always the answer. In Judges chapter 2, in the book of Judges, it's about the judges. Good title. <laughs> Judges chapter 2 verse 10 reads like this. After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. This is right at the point after Joshua and the leaders of Israel had died. And they're saying that the generation that had grown up didn't acknowledge God. They didn't focus on him, and they didn't remember what God had done for them. We're in a place today that many people do not acknowledge God, but they will focus on themselves. They may have moments where God shows up, and God is real to them, but then they turn it, and it becomes all about self. All about me instead of living broken by him. We can look at the book of Judges and see the cycle of life the children of Israel lived in Judges 2, 18 through 19. It reads like this. 
whenever the Lord raised up a judge of Israel, he was with that judge and rescued his people from their enemies. Throughout the judge's lifetime, for the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened and by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. How do you know people like that, that refuse to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways? I'm stubborn. I have a stubborn streak in me. But there are times I really got to be careful because if I don't give and lay everything down and live in that place of laying everything down, then it becomes about me and what I want and what I desire instead of what he wants. You can look at judges. In fact, let's go there. Joshua judges Ruth. If you need help. We're going to start in Judges chapter 3. We're just going to kind of go through the book of Judges. We're going to start in verse 7. It says this, Judges 3, 7, The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They forgot about the Lord their God, and they served the images of Baal and the Asherah poles. Then the Lord burned with anger against Israel, and he turned them over to King Kishon Rishathaim, and of Aram and Neathaim, and the Israelites served Cush Rishathaim for eight years. Judges 3.12. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord and gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Judges 4.1. After Ehud died, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived... In Heshrol Hagayom. I love, I love titles in the Bible. They're so fun. You can jump over to Judges 6. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed him over to the Midianites for seven years. You see this throughout the book of Judges. Israel does evil in the Lord's sight. He turns him over to a king. They cry out. He sends a judge. They save him. The judge dies. They do evil in the sight of the Lord. He hands him over to their enemy. You see it over and over and over. It's just this cycle of life that they live in. But you know, your choice to live for self will always lead you to a broken place. If you live for self, it will lead you to a worldly place broken place not a broken place in Christ our place of brokenness is not our submission to God in a worldly standpoint it's our submission to us when we submit to ourselves we will always find our place broken by life circumstance but when we submit to God and we fully submit to him we will find ourselves in a place of brokenness for him Colossians. I love the book of Colossians. You know, when Lauren and I were on staff at a church, we took Colossians chapter 3, and we took it, and we placed it, Colossians 3.17, we placed it on every single pulpit, on every single music stand, on everything. I love this verse. I'm not going to read it today, but if you want to, you can read it. Colossians 3, 5 through 7 reads like this. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping things of the world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things in your life when your life was still a part of this world. We try and place happiness in the things of life, in the way we treat others. According to Allure magazine, I love this statistic. 50% of the people surveyed said that they felt better about themselves if they were prettier. Or if they had the right amount of clothes. Or if they had the, the right amount, if they could shape their beard in the perfect way, which mine is pretty stinking good. I may say so myself. 
Daniel Dean sitting back there. That kid loves his hair. You see, I spent seven weeks with Daniel Dean in a sound booth. I earned the right to talk about his hair. <laughs> he loves it. But if we have this notion inside of us that what we do to ourselves will make us appear better in life, we are focusing on the things of life and not the things of him. 41% of millennials say this, that they have felt better about themselves because someone else looked bad. Hmm. Someone else looked bad, so I feel better about myself. We live in a broken system. Why would we base our lives off of that broken system? The brokenness we're longing for, true brokenness, comes not from a system or a new program, but a life that is less of me and more of him. Matthew 7, 13, out of the Message Bible. I found this when I was studying for another sermon, and I absolutely love it. It's so plain and so simple. It reads like this. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. Verse 14 reads like this. The way to life to God is vigorous and requires full attention. So life is flooded with lots of ways that will make you successful. Air quotes. I love them. They will make you successful. There's surefire ways that you can think this is the way to go. This is the way to do it. But all you're doing is taking your attention off of God onto something that makes your life easier. Now, is there anything wrong with easiness in life? Absolutely not. Life is fun and there are parts of life that are easy. But there are times in life when we really have to buckle down And instead of trying to find something that makes us feel better, the way to feel better is to put your total attention on him. And we put our total attention on him. We can allow ourselves to come into a place of true brokenness with him. John 3.30. He must become greater and greater, so I must become less and less. He must become greater and greater so I can become less and less. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 reads like this. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. We have been made alive in Christ, alive in him. We have his breath inside of us. We have everything about us is him. We were created in his image and in his likeness. When God breathed into us, he breathed the breath of life. Now. Life was corrupted by sin, as you see in Colossians 3, 5 through 7. All the things of the world you used to do, but I like verse 8, it reads like this. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malice, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on the new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Get rid of all of the things of life as you learn your creator and live to become more like him. How do you become more like him? You have to be humble. You have to be real. 
Matthew chapter 5. It's the Beatitudes. Sometimes we have an attitude when we read the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 5 reads like this. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Humble is to lower yourself in stature or dignity. In Christ, to grow, we must be willing to shrink. To live, we must be willing to die. Acts 17, 28. In him we live and move and have our very being. I heard a preacher once talk about roaring lambs. That's a pretty weird title. Lambs don't roar. Lions roar. But what he was talking about was living a life lowly and meek and allowing God to raise up a warrior inside of you. The brokenness that keeps us alive is going to a place that is not ruled by self and that the evidence and the info of life cannot be spun around. We, one of our things we enjoy doing is we enjoy sitting and when we get a chance to and just watching TV. That's our, just, that's our relaxed time. We don't have to think about anything. We can put our phones away and we can just chill. It's kind of mindless, I know. But sometimes you need that mindless moment. We're watching a show and it was, it was a cop show. A lot of action in it. And one of the things the cop show talked about is how you have to focus and understand the information can be spun around. You can, if somebody tells you something, you can take that information and it may be true, but there may be a part of it that's true. There may be a moment of it that's true, but information can be spun. We have to live in a place where the information we receive is not spun. You see, we can take the Bible and we can read it, but I can put my own spin on it. It's not what we're supposed to do, but I can put my own spin on it information given to you by someone else can have their spin on it. I love I, I love reading the Bible and I love reading the different books of the Bible and looking at the author's point of view. What did the author really mean when they said this? What did the, you know, because God inspired them to write the Bible, but you can look at the different stories throughout all of the Gospels. They may be the exact same story of Jesus healing the lady with the withered hand. Luke is specific and says it was her right hand. Luke was a doctor. He was specific in his writing. You see, you can look at all the different moments and see their viewpoint on it. It's the same story, but it's their viewpoint. Information can be spun. But there's one place that we get information where it cannot be spun. And that's directly from him. And the only way we get information directly from him is to live in a place of brokenness. A place where we are less of me and more of him. I love the book of Psalms. One of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible is found in Psalm 91. Psalm 91.1 He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If you want to truly understand who God is, curl up under His wing. Lean against Him and let Him breathe. Because when that happens, you're truly hearing the heartbeat of the Father. You're not hearing the heartbeat via a video. You're not hearing the heartbeat via a sermon. You're hearing the heartbeat directly from the heart that's beating. You know, Lauren and I have had some struggles as of late. Um, We were in the middle 
of an adoption. And in that adoption, the the people came to us, and, and there's a little bit of backstory of we were in the middle of uh, going through our fostering license and becoming foster parents. And as we were doing that, we were the day we were getting ready to turn everything in, we got a phone call. Hey, we know you guys, and we know that you take care of things. Um, we're pregnant, we can't keep the baby. You see, Lauren and I have been in the process of trying to have children on our own. And things just weren't working. So we felt like God was calling us to foster because there are children out there who need a home. We heard a statistic recently. Um, it's in the 400s. I don't remember the exact number. But 400 plus children are living in homes of abuse and neglect because there are not homes for them to go to. They still have to live in that world because there are not places for them to go to. Now, this is not a you need to be foster parents moment. But we felt like that's the way God was calling us. And our prayer was for a baby. Being first time parents, I didn't really want a six year old. I love I loved kids, but I wanted a baby. So we prayed about it. Okay, God. So we got this call that they wanted us to adopt their baby. Prayed about it. Okay, we went through all the process. We were at every appointment. We were at every ultrasound. I got to see pictures of this baby. I got to hear this baby's heartbeat. We had a name picked out. We had a crib put together. I had a nursery prepared. My life was ready to go. I was so excited to have this baby. Week six of teen camp, or week six of camp. Monday night. I go home. I open the door. Excited to be there, not knowing. My wife comes to me and is in tears. What's wrong? What's, what's going on? She just hands me her phone. There was a text message of all things from the mother telling us that she was going to keep her baby. And that she had thought about it and they had a plan and a little bit of backstory this mother has issues we were angry I was angry because I had planned I had purposed I knew I had a name picked out for this child I was angry In fact, last night, I got angry again because there was some text message that came back and forth. I got angry again. And you know, I had to go to a place of broken. Circumstances were broken around me. But if I didn't run to the place where I was under his shadow, I could have become very bitter. And even now, as I'm talking about this, the enemy is beginning to fight in my head about being angry and bitter. But I know whose I am. I know he is mine. And I know that he has a purpose and a plan for this. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 reads like this. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. It does not say that his power is made perfect in my strength. That would make no sense. I have a lot of strength in life. You can ask my wife. One time we, our fridge died. Like, went bad. I walked home one, it was, while well, it was a camp three years ago. 
I go home, I open the fridge door, I grab the gallon of milk, open it up, take a big old swig of it. I didn't get liquid, I got a chunk. I threw it up. I love cottage cheese, but not out of a milk container. I threw that sucker away. Actually, I did. I stuck it back in the fridge. I asked her, I said, what happened? She said, well, while you were at camp, our fridge went out. Awesome. So we got a new fridge, and she was trying to pull everything out of it so she could move it and sweep behind it. And I have some strength. I just bear hugged it and moved it. And she likes to tell the story that I picked it up and walked it four feet and all that. I just moved it. You see, I have some strength in my life, but his power is not made perfect in my strength. It's made perfect in our hope. No, that's not true either. Because I have hope. I have hope for a child. I have hope that God's going to do some really big things. His strength is not made perfect in my hope. In our practice, His strength is made perfect. Not quite. Because I can practice life. I can get really good at practicing life. Putting on a smile. Everything's cool. My life is amazing. I'm fine. My practice is not where his strength is made perfect. But it's in my weakness. In the moment where I don't feel like I can go on anymore. In the moment where I get angry. In the moment where I'm struggling with bitterness. In the moment where I'm alone dealing with things in my own head. My life is full of weakness. Our weakness shows up when we depend on self to do the job. We each have inadequacies. Something that we try to keep from others. We try and we show others our good side. I got a new phone. And uh, this phone has portrait mode on it. So when I go to take a selfie, I can make it look really, really good. I can take a picture of you if you're eight feet away from me. And I can make the background blur out. And I can make you look really, really good. And I'll post that bad boy to social media. Because I make myself look good on social media. I have to. When my, when my brother and I were little, one of our favorite things, we love Christmas. So we'd go and we'd go pick out a real Christmas tree. Now, we would not go out in the woods and find one and cut one down and haul it home. We were not Little House on the Prairie by any means. We would go to a tree farm where they planted them specifically to be cut down. They planted these things and we'd go out there and we'd find the perfect tree. Christmas tree. We'd tag it. They'd go out there with their little cart and they'd cut it down and bring it back and they'd stick it on this thing and it would shake the tree. It would shake the dead out of the tree. We'd get that thing home and in the field it may have looked perfect. We got it home after they shook it out. There were some holes in that bad boy because there were some dead we didn't see. You'd get it home. We'd put it up and we'd get it set and you'd be sitting in the chair looking at it and there'd be a big hole so what did we do we turned it around we put the hole against the wall so nobody could see it so it gave the image of perfection but it really had some problems our spot of imperfection does not disqualify us but it qualifies us to grow in his strength. So now I am glad to boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. My weakness is his strength. 
his shadow, his rest, his protection, his provision, his purity, his guidance, his will, his healing, his wisdom, his word, his speech, his strength is my weakness. In the book of Psalms, we find King David. I love King David. King David would make an awesome movie. Awesome movie. A lot of action. But this is a point in King David's life that would make the movie not rated PG. David had some imperfections, some impurities. He saw this chick. She was really pretty. You see, there's a sermon there because David should have been on the battlefield with his men instead of hanging out in his palace. And he see this chick across the hall, across the roadway, and he calls for her, brings her over. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, and then he kills her husband. He sent him back out to the battlefield. David was an adulterer and a murderer. And God comes to David through a prophet and says, Hey, you're going to lose your kid. You're going to lose some things. This is David's response. Psalm 51. And I'm going to jump all the way to the end of 16 and 17. And it reads like this. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. Sacrifice is giving up of something. A sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice of giving yourself up to God. In that day, he was talking about a sacrifice of laying an animal on the altar and sacrificing it for his sins. That's not what God was desiring. God loves when you sacrifice he loves it but when it comes to true brokenness that's not what God's interested in I know that sounds really harsh but stick with me for a moment you do not want a burnt offering A sacrifice will not sustain you through the cycle of life. You will continually have to sacrifice. You will continually have to continue to give up. I heard a pastor one time call it spiritual bulimia and anorexia. Spiritual bulimia is when you get up to the altar, you fill up on God go into the world you get into the world you fill up in the world and then you come in on Sunday and you throw it all up again and you fill up on God and you get into Monday and you throw up God and you fill up in the world and you come in on Sunday and you throw up all God and then you feel like you know just this cycle of life a sacrifice will not sustain you the cycle will continue A sacrifice is giving or taking one thing to help another. He's not asking for your sacrifice. He sacrificed for you. He doesn't want an offering or to be given a portion. He doesn't want the seconds and the thirds of life. See, there are times in life we get busy. Lauren talked about busyness yesterday and being proud of our busyness. Being proud of our busyness. But when we're busy, we lack our moments with Him. And when we lack our moments with Him, we lack our chance for true brokenness. Because in our busyness, we become all about self and how much we can handle, how much we can do. And it will take you to a breaking point. He doesn't want that. He wants a sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart. 
a repentive spirit because verse 17 reads like this. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and a repentant heart, O oh God. The way we live broken is not in the system. It's not in the passion of life, but in the moment that we fall, we can have a brokenness with Him. When we give ourselves up, we can have a brokenness with Him. You know, I want to read this scripture. 2 Corinthians 4, in verse 7, it reads like this. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. In Matthew chapter 9, this parable is talking, and it's talking about putting old things and new things. He, he says that about putting, you can't put new wine in an old wine skin. Now, I did a little bit of research, a little bit of thinking, and a little bit of praying. And When you are made new in Christ, you cannot keep the old. And you can't try to put the new in the old. Because the old doesn't have the power to contain what God's giving you for the new. It will eventually burst. It will eventually break. And then you're left with bits and pieces that you don't know what to do with. We have to stay humble. Falling into Him and living by Him and living in Him. Connected to the vine and breathing Him in. That's the only way we stay in a place of brokenness is living in Him and being in Him. Romans 12, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hebrews 12, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. I love this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to the life and faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I preached a sermon one time called Your Default. Each one of us have what's called a default. In electronics, there's a little button on the back of it, and it says, reset and you have to have a pin that is like itty bitty tiny to stick in that hole to reset that bad boy I have a phone and on my phone I can click reset and it'll say do you really want to reset this thing because if you do you're going to lose everything all your save settings all your games all your apps all your contacts all your pictures you're going to lose it all if you hit this reset button you see, we all have this default sin. This thing that so easily trips us up. When life hits you hard, where do you go? Do you go to your default? Or do you go to the one that can reset the default? You see... go to the default of me and not of him because he is our strength he is our freedom he is our life he is our passion he is our guidance he is our speech he is our walk he is our deliverance. He is our priority. He is our strong tower. He is loving. He is kind. He is the King of Kings. 
He is our Savior. He is our sacrifice. He is our hope. He is our wellspring of life. He is my friend. He is my purity. He is my desire. He follows through. He is the healer. He's all-knowing. He knows what you have need of before you ask. He knows what you have need of before you even really know what you have need of. He's all-powerful. Zach Version says, dude, is strong. He's got everything you ever need. He's got the strength for your weakness. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. He's everywhere. He's the anointed one. He's alive. He is grace embodied. He's creator. He's righteousness. He's love. He's sincere. He's merciful. No means of measurement can define his limitless love. Who is he to you? Who do you need him to be? Do you need him to be your strength today? Do you need him to be your life today? Do you need him to be your healer today? Do you need to reset your focus back to him? Do you need to follow up on something that he's asked you to follow up on? Do you need his boldness in your life to be a light to the friends around you, to the people around you? What do you need from him today? You see, true brokenness is all about him. It's all about getting in a place where it is less of me and more of him. When I become less, he becomes greater. 